Second time's the charm. All right, so in this video, we're gonna go over the basic configuration steps that you need to make to Nextcloud after you do the install. Unlike the first video, I'm not gonna go through all of the steps as I actually set things up. I'm just gonna let you know where you need to go, and then I'm going to provide web links to all of the items and, and where the instructions are on the internet that I went through to make my Nextcloud system actually work well for me. All of that information will be down in the description. You're gonna have timestamps and everything. So the first thing that I wanna address in this video, there was a question in the comments from someone named Brian. He had questions about a virtual machine and mounting external hard drives. I'm gonna let you know right now, you can in fact mount external hard drives and those are some of the steps that I'm gonna go through right now while we're on the topic. If you're doing an external hard drive and you're also doing this on a virtual machine, I actually really like this idea. It's a good way to go because you can move with Oracle VirtualBox your install of Ubuntu server or whatever you're using anywhere you want. So to any hard drive, to any system, you should be able to mount this disk anywhere. So I, I installed Ubuntu server right here. This is one of my extra drives. I keep two, two terabyte disks virtually mirrored. I don't use rsync because I end up wiping my system too frequently for that even to be set up. But you can find these this file right here. And actually with these virtual machines, it's a really good way to go because you can duplicate your virtual machine. You can actually clone it in Oracle VirtualBox if you want to. I think there's just a clone control somewhere. Pull this up right here. So you can actually clone these drives if you want. And then you have a dev environment you can work with or a staging environment, especially if you wanna do something like a PHP upgrade, which you have to do basically every year based on the roadmap. So that's a really good way to go. I would just drop that on your five terabyte disk in response to that exact question. Yes, you're gonna lose a little bit of performance when it comes to loading the CSS and HTML when you're going from a spinning hard disk, but really when you're navigating around these files, if you're gonna put the files on the spinning disk anyway, most of your performance is, is going to be reliant on those documents. So just drop that file or, or tell VirtualBox to install on your external hard drive and you should be good to go. For the rest of this video, I'm gonna have this all segmented out into different areas. It's all gonna be time stamped, and I'm going to give you a quick overview of what's in it right now. If you find a section that's helpful for you, please leave a thumbs up and help other people like you find this material when they're trying to go through a Nextcloud setup. First thing we're gonna go through is something that I should have shown in the last video, which is how to set your upload limits for Nextcloud. By default, your php.ini file is going to set you at an eight megabyte limit and that's gonna be frustrating. Second thing, we're gonna hop over, I'm gonna show you where the security section is and where the errors are that you're going to need to resolve for any kind of security issues that your system might have. I'm not gonna go through that process, it was way too much of my life to, to recap. I'm gonna go through and show you how to do dynamic DNS routing and what I did for making sure that I could always target my home network. I'm gonna show you how to change the root location for Apache so that you don't have to type in your URL through your dynamic DNS provider and then do the forward slash nextcloud to dive in and log into your system. I'll show you the basics of how to install an SSL when you don't have access to port 80. So in my case, Cox has that disabled. In upon reflection, I think it's actually a good idea to have port 80 disabled just because there's a lot of security issues there. 
I'll show you how to auto mount the hard drives. That's the exciting stuff. That's the stuff that I was actually asked about on the last video. And I'll go through my cron tab and give you a basic overview of what's going on. Uh, part of that cron tab is mounting the hard drives. I decided not to go with Open Media Vault. Some of it is backups. And then there's also a little section in here that I think is kind of cool that I want to show you for temporary file sharing. Finally, I'll close this all off with what still needs to be done with the system and then what I would do if I were to do this install again, if I were going to set up a different system. So let's just jump right into the material and I will show you how to change the upload limits on your ph in your php.ini file so that you can upload files larger than eight megabytes. Okay, so the first thing you're gonna wanna do if you're running headless then you're gonna wanna putty into your system and then you're going to navigate over to this file right here. It's Etsy PHP 7.3. And if we do a quick LS, we'll be able to see that there's two documents in this folder. Oh no, wrong folder. CD to Apache 2. So Etsy PHP 7.3 Apache 2. And then we'll be able to see what is in here. And you have a conf.d and you have php.ini. What you need to do is, as a super user, so sudo nano php.ini, you're going to need to go through and change a few values in this document. This is what I'm going to put in the description below. It's a link to a help, a help page for Nextcloud and it goes through the different items that you need to change in your php.ini file. You need to change the memory limit, the max execution time, and then your file sizes. So I'll just quickly show you how to do a, a search in this document. You're gonna do control W because that's the where is command in nano. And you don't do that. I exited right on out of there. So where is, and then you paste that right in there. What I did was a control V when I'm in putty, so I need to do shift control V. And you'll see post max size, I changed that. That was eight megabytes. So I just added the 204 right in front of the eight megabytes to make it 2048, that's two gigs. And you're just going to need to do that where is command to find each of these different items and then set them appropriately for what you need to do in your setup. Relatively straightforward. It should be quick and it's going to save you a lot of frustration. Besides the frustration though, one of the big things with this file server is I'm assuming that you want it to be secure. So, for security, I'm going to go through and show you where your security issues will show up once you have an install. In your admin section, you're going to want to go over to settings. Inside of the settings area, you'll see an administration area on the left hand column. And in this area, you're going to have overview. And when you click on overview, it's going to have a section that tells you about your system security. Some of this stuff isn't completely important, but some of it is critical. And you'll know what's critical because it will be in red font. So you go through there and you're going to search and you're gonna figure out how to resolve each of those issues. It's going to require a bunch of time on the next cloud help pages. But one of the things that I was able to find, there are some awesome users in this forum. So you will be able to find the answers to stuff. It just might take a while, take a little bit of digging. In the last video, I was showing you that I would log into my system using the local IP address, which was 192.168.1.8 on my local network. I didn't want to use that all the time. I wanted to use an, a URL so that I could have a user-friendly name that I could give to specific people 
who are very, very close to me so that they would have access to the system if they wanted to. Like, for example, my dad, he's always running out of cloud storage space because he's always taking pictures of stuff and a lot of times he deletes the images, but it would be really convenient if he could have some kind of a cloud backup system so his phone doesn't bark at him anymore. To fill this role, I chose no IP. And a lot of the videos out there are going to recommend that you use something called, I think, DuckDNS. I did not want to go with DuckDNS in part because to sign in, they require different stuff like they wanted me to link the, the system to my Google account. And part of my motivation for setting up Nextcloud is to increase my level of independence. Yes, with no IP, I am dependent on this vendor, but instead of going with a freeware version where I am the product, because if you're not paying, then you are the product, I went with a vendor that actually charged. You can have a free account on no IP, but one of the things that's difficult with no IP and setting up a free account is if you have to, you have to log in periodically every 30 days, within every 30 days, in order to continue to renew your domain name. I actually see paying for my domain name as a bonus because number one, it means I'm not a product and the 30 day is really an inconvenience fee. So eventually you pay the one or $2 a month so that you sign up with the service anyway. But also with a financial relationship, it's not a one way dependency. I'm not entirely dependent on them. They're not entirely dependent on me. It's more of a relationship going on. So I went with no IP and one of the things with a dynamic DNS provider is you need to install some software that identifies your IP address so that they know where to route your traffic to. So in this case, they have documentation in their knowledge base and it is how to install no IP duck on Raspberry Pi. It's kind of funny that it's called duck when duck DNS was the other provider. Probably not a coincidence. And what you're going to do here is these instructions are extremely simple. You're going to make a directory for no IP. You're going to go to that directory. So make dear home pi no IP CD to that directory. You're going to W get to the link here, no IP duck. It looks like they keep it up to date because there's no version numbers in this link. That was something we went over in the last video, making sure you're downloading the latest version number. You're going to unzip it with tar and then you're going to change directory into that area with CD, no IP. Uh, this, you might need to change this version number depending on if this documentation on this page is uh, up at your time of downloading, which this is no IP support knowledge base install IP duck into Raspberry Pi. Again, I'm going to leave all these web links into the in the video description so that you will have access to all the documentation you need to set up your system. And then you're going to make, you're going to make install and you will be able to log in and set it up. In my case, I think that this system actually did ask me a few questions, but this user guide is extremely straightforward and if you really want it, I think they have a video somewhere that actually walks you through the steps also. So their documentation is really thorough. I really like this service provider. I'm happy with the people that I chose. In the last video, one of the things that you saw was that what I was typing in on my local network was I was typing in 192.168.1.8 and then forward slash nextcloud. This is not really necessary if we take these next steps and This is actually one of the things that I know how to do from memory. So if we change directory, we want to go to CD Etsy Apache 2 and then sites available. We are going to nano into our default comp file. One of the things that you will see automatically that I've done in this file is change my document root. So you can see here there www.html. 
Originally, this was set with just bare H WW H HTML. So anytime that Apache got pinged, it would automatically direct you into that HTML folder, which meant that if you wanted to go one directory lower, if you wanted to go to Nextcloud, you had to go HTML and then forward slash Nextcloud to navigate down into that directory. By simply adding slash Nextcloud to the end here, I was able to direct all of that traffic into Nextcloud, and now my URL just works simply like you would expect. So it's myurl.com. You type that in, it goes automatically to Nextcloud, courtesy of no IP. So makes things really convenient, user-friendly, exactly what you would expect from any other cloud service. Now this may need to be updated if you are installing an SSL certificate as far as the other document that's in this drive. So if we do a simple ls, you can see there's a default SSL conf. I think there might have been something that I did in that document as well. But that's really a good transition so we can start talking about SSL and how to get that installed using Let's Encrypt, which is a free service. As far as their documentation on their website said though, it looked like they're an open source project that's run off of donations. So I'm not as concerned about being a product using th their particular items. If they ever become a problem, I might start using self-signed certificates. Now the advantage of going with say a paid provider over someone like uh, Let's Encrypt is paid providers offer, if I recall correctly, some kind of insurance, which is awesome if you're running an e-commerce site because if traffic gets encrypted, if credit card information is stolen, then you are protected. Well, with Let's Encrypt, if my information is stolen, I don't think that the other providers would necessarily cover that because there's no commerce going on between me and myself. I'm just going across data. And if there's anything that we know about insurance companies, they will do anything in their power to not pay. If you're blessed enough to have port 80 unlocked on your particular system, then you'll be able to install an SSL certificate using just a standard install uh, SSL certificate. The process is relatively straightforward. But if you're in a situation like me, then you will need to manually install your CertBot certificate. So that's what we're gonna go over here is we're gonna go into how to do the manual setup. So one of the first things you need to do, you need to add the CertBot repository. This is what connects you to Let's Encrypt. So that's what CertBot is, is it's their specific software. So this user here has add the repository Ubuntu or Raspberry Pi, they're going to use apt and then Ubuntu based systems will have these PPAs so that you can add the software. You're going to get an update after you set up the PPA and then you're going to install CertBot. Now this is the important part. This is the manual challenge. And one of the things about not having port 80 open is normally what CertBot will do is it will ping Let's Encrypt and then have Let's Encrypt check that you own your server by pinging port 80. But if port 80 is closed, you can't do that. So you have to go through a manual challenge. So if we take this command right here, I'll show you really quick without actually pinging their server too hard. I'm going to do the manual challenge. So now I just need to add a domain my URL demo.com. What you do with this code is because it gives you this code, it's kind of complex, it's not easy to duplicate. You take this and then you go over to your dynamic DNS provider. This might actually require that you have a paid service. What you need to do with this code is you need to take it over to your website in your dynamic DNS provider and you're going to need to input it into your text record. So you can see here on no IP there's a text record and you can go through, you can click this and then you'll paste that code into the text record. The manual challenge isn't easy to do in an automated way but if you're just doing this 
as kind of a hands-on thing, it'll work okay. You're going to add that text record, then when Let's Encrypt actually pings your domain name provider, they will look at the text record, they'll see that you actually do own your domain, and then you will be able to continue with this process just by clicking enter. I'm going to click on enter. I didn't add the text thing on there, so I'll just get a negative point for today for pinging their server when I shouldn't have. There we go. So once you have the, your SSL certificate downloaded onto your system, which is going to be part of this whole process, it's going to give you instructions on how to download it. If it, it might actually download it to your system if, if you give your port number, but uh, there's a few other steps you have to go through on here. It's relatively quick. I actually did it on my personal website where I have access to port 80. This whole process of going through the verification through the text process it adds the step of adding this code as text, and I think there's like one or two other steps that are beyond what you would do over port 80. It's really not that complicated to go through this. This is what's called a DNS01 challenge. The normal setup is, is the HTTP01 challenge. Once you have these codes downloaded, you will use the web link that I will provide for how to enable SSL in five minutes. Whoever wrote this guide, I think it's Charles's blog. Yeah, Charles's blog at hallard.me. This guide is awesome. It actually did take me about five minutes to set up and I had never set up SSL before. So Apache is really simple. My personal website is Nginx. That was a lot more complicated to do. Um, so I'll leave that web link in there below. Okay, this was done in 2012, so this document has held up super well over the years. Now comes the part that you've all been waiting for, the mounting of hard drives. I did not use Open Media Vault. I decided to go with just modifying my FSTAB file. Now, I brought this up briefly in the last video. Let's just clear this out really quick and go home. When I start my Raspberry Pi, even when I have items in my STAB file, the drives do not mount reliably. So I'm going to kind of go through the basics of how to set this up and show you what's going on. So you need in your STAB file the part UUID dropped in there. So that command is blkid. What I'm going to do is lsblk here just so that you can kind of see which drives I have set up for what. blkid will give you these part UUIDs and this is what you need for your fstab file. lsblk will list all of your drives and make sure that they are all mounted to the files that you want them to be because everything in Linux is a file or a directory. The way I was originally going to do this setup is I was going to have two one terabyte drives, one of which would be backing up the SD card, and then I had a one terabyte disk and a three terabyte disk. And the three terabyte disk was going to back up and take multiple images of, of one of my ones. Unfortunately, the drive enclosure that I purchased is not compatible with Linux, and it, actually it corrupted my system, so I had to install Manjaro in between the last video and this one. So I went with a slightly different setup, where I have one image on my one terabyte disk of my local SD card, I have three images on my three terabyte drive, and then my three terabyte drive backs up this one terabyte disk. So lots and lots of backups. You wanna make sure your data is actually protected. Give yourself enterprise grade security and backups. That's kind of the objective of what we're doing here. So let's jump into mounting the disks. So we're going to change directories. We're going to go to sudo nano, oh, not change directory. We'll do, we'll just go there. We know where fstab is. It's in Etsy and fstab. After doing this, I decided 
you know, on my Manjaro install to do it on my main system as well. Because it's not as robust as, as meant as far as the different GUI controls that it has, but this FSTAB setup is pretty sweet once I show you how to mount these external drives reliably. So when we edit this FSTAB file, you'll see that I have the part UUIDs, which I grabbed from here. So 7A152E, 7A152E, and I mounted these to locations. I have a media folder and then backup core. and backup storage. So backup core was originally supposed to be set up to mount and backup my main drive and then backup storage I think was just purely for backups. What I also did though is I added this 64 gigabyte USB 3 drive and this is purely temporary it's not backed up, and in fact, when I get into the cron tab, I'll show you that it actually auto erases periodically, and it's all actually set up. So when you set up this, this FSTAB file, when you have this auto no fail no dev here, one of the things that they will tell you is that the no fail tells the system complete booting even if the hard drive doesn't show up as there. Well, I thought by removing no fail that the system would wait until the hard drive was online before it mounted, but it didn't do that. That uh, wasn't a successful experiment. It just made it so my Raspberry Pi wouldn't mount at all, which was a problem. I actually had to go in and and manually edit my FSTAB file from outside of my Raspberry Pi system. So that was no good. Don't, don't do that. Don't remove this no fail option. You want the no fail option on there. Now I had an issue where my drives would mount. Sometimes one of them would mount, sometimes two, sometimes none. And I found a command that was mount dash A and this would force it to mount once the operating system was up. So I went ahead and I set up a cron job, especially because I had to set up cron jobs for backups anyway. And I will actually copy and paste that into the description below. Hopefully there's enough room so that you can go through and copy my setup if you really want to, as far as backups and as far as setting up a drive that auto erases. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go and we're going to take a look at this cron tab. And a lot of people will call this cron table. Some people will call it cron jobs. But we're going to go through and we're going to take a look at how I have this set up to mount. There's a little bit more information over this line, but for now what we're looking at is all that is relevant I will drop the command in to auto re renew your SSL certificate in the video description as long as there's enough room. I think there will be. But the command to make sure that your drives mount on boot is just this option right here at reboot mount a. It'll run that command every time your system restarts. That way your FSTAB file will be pinged and all of your drives will be mounted. Now that we're talking about cron jobs, I'm going to go through the basics of how cron tables actually work. So the first column here, this is minutes, this is hours, this is days, this is day of month, and this is weekday. So in this case, every day on the hour at 11 p.m. at night, it's going to run this rsync and it's going to take an exact copy it, and delete any files that shouldn't be in there while excluding my trash can. And it's going to copy the ver folder, 
what's in my Ver folder is important stuff. Not only does it have my data for my Nextcloud setup, but it also has the Nextcloud configuration, and it also has the database for Nextcloud. So if I ever need to restore the system completely, I should be able to do that. No, I don't know how. That's a problem for future me to figure out. So I'm going to take that, and I do this daily on onto the three terabyte disk and then onto the one terabyte disk. I also do a weekly and a monthly backup onto the three terabyte disk, as well as a backup of the one terabyte drive onto the three terabyte disk. So that three terabyte disk, if I add a bunch of stuff on here, it's really gonna get used to the max, but I do have all of the capacity that I need to completely fill up both of these drives and still have everything workable. This little section of the cron table, I don't know if I'll put it in the description or not. It's just for my unique situation. I have a lot of documents that I'm trying to put into my next cloud and I don't necessarily want to go entirely through the web interface. So if I decide to migrate some of that stuff in here using an external hard drive or an SD card where I copy and paste things into my media folder, specifically on the external drive, which is kind of configured in such a way that it's stuff that's really not gonna change. I wanna make sure that those permissions get reset because if I move the documents in there using root permissions, those files will be set as created by root and I might not be able to modify them from my Nextcloud web interface. So I wanna make sure that my database user has access to that file using these, you know, commands, chown, I, I put both of these commands in the video from before, chmod 750. So if you wanna make sure that you can migrate stuff in there really quickly through an external hard drive, these are the commands that you need to run after you move your files onto that drive. So for this section, this is the area that I have for temporary storage. So I'll just show you really quick what I've got going on. When I go over to files, there is a 64 gigabyte USB 3 disk that's not backed up. And what I did was I called it 50 gig USB drive or something like that. Yeah, 50 gig temporary storage. Really, this drive has about 55 gigs of usable space because of the way that they do hard drive math which isn't like regular math. So if you click on this right here, you can see there's a few folders. There's one day, one week, one month, one year, and then junk drawer. One week, one week, or one day, one week, one month, and one year will delete anything in that folder in the time frame that's recommended. So one day, you put something in there, the next day, it'll be wiped, as long as it's, it's over that time limit. Now I didn't select exactly those days, I used magic numbers here. But you can see at 9-11 in the morning, it's going to delete everything from the one day folder. At 9-11 at night, once a week, actually a little bit more than once a week, or a little bit less than once a week, we have a few days in there, it's going to wipe everything in the weekly folder at 3.33, it's going to wipe anything that's over 33 days old. And then at 11.11, 11, every 366 days, it's going to delete everything from the one-year folder. So this way you can put things in there and if you wanna you know, put a fire under someone like, hey, this file's only gonna be in here for a day, then you will be able to share those documents with them and know that you don't have to constantly clean out that disk. I do have the junk drawer, this one doesn't delete, but this is something that I will wipe if anything you know, happens to pop up. Finally, we can do like a quick review. With these mounted drives that I showed you, anything that goes in the, these files, actually it doesn't look like there's a way to properly lock them down unless you lock them down globally. And what I mean by that is if you give someone access to one of these external drives, they will be able to see everything in it. 
And if you want them to have access to the external drive, you have to give them access to the external drive. So these would be areas that you don't want to put anything in there like a, a password manager, for example. And the way that I have this set up is this 50 gig drive is for short term storage. I also have this 500 gig external drive. This has information, my old music library, I have videos, anything that's really not going to change. Most of this stuff, you know, is, uh, it's not really secret. You know, I've got stuff in here. It's for my sister's wedding. You know, everyone loves that kind of stuff. I've got just random videos. I've got a scream of videos from different tournaments and classes that I thought were interesting. So everything is in this drive, your main folder right here. This is where you have more enclosed access to where you've got kind of your private space. And this is set up on, of course, the SD card and really the working files. And that's one of the reasons why I have the SD card backed up in two different places is that way I've got triplicate copies so that if my friends and I or my family and I are working on a document and something goes wrong and that gets corrupted, well, that work in progress will actually be saved. Especially with, with triple back backups, it's, it's really nice. So I'll close out this video. We've gone over everything from security to convenience to backups and how to mount external hard drives. But I do want to cover what still needs to be done and what I would do differently next time. So the first thing that needs to be done, these, this cron table, some of these jobs need to be separated out over time. You'll see I have a couple hours in between each of these, these cron tables. And this, that's because I'm using rsync to do my backups. And you really don't want those rsync items running into each other because then your next backup protocol might not actually happen. And when that happens, yes, I want to save. When that happens, you will be able to go through and check mail. And you'll see that there's no mail for Pi. What I need to do is I need to set up the system so that it will actually email me if something goes wrong. And right now there is no mail server set up and it's not connected to a mail server. So if something goes wrong, I won't know about it unless I come into my Raspberry Pi and I type in mail or sudo mail. Oh, okay. So in this case, there have been some errors popping up and I didn't even know about that. Probably something to do with my, with my backups. So I'm just going to quit that. So again, important that you actually check your mail in your system. And the thing that I would have done differently, I would have followed the setup that the last commenter on my video said he was using, which was setting things up on a virtual machine for all the reasons I explained before. You're going to be able to move that document around. You're going to be able to zip it up. Actually, it's going to be much easier to clone that document or that file because all of your virtual machines are actually files on your computer to the cloud. So this, in this case, you've got Ubuntu server. So if you want your stuff to be secret, you just take that document, you have it zipped up, you encrypt it, and then you upload it to a service like, in my case, I probably go with Backblaze because they do $5 a month for unlimited storage and you can back up your encrypted files so no one will look at it. I don't know what the security is like for Backblaze, but if your file is properly encrypted, then they shouldn't have access to anything. They also have convenient service. I think they'll send you stuff on a flash disk if you ask for it. The other reason why I would do it on, on a drive like this is 
With the Raspberry Pi 4 and the 400 gigabyte disc that I ended up running with, it worked out to something like $120. And I ended up with a total amount of space of about 900 gigs. Now I had a bunch of external hard drives laying around, or sorry, internal hard drives that I was able to convert into external hard drives. But that just cut my costs in general. If you're having to buy, you know, a large number of hard drives, then you really want to keep this system as stupid simple as possible. And for the amount of money that I spent, I got roughly 900 gigs, 8 to 900 gigs of actual usable storage space. I could have spent $90 on a SATA SSD from a decent manufacturer, and I would have had 900 gigs of space anyway all of it extremely fast instead of in this case where half of my space is on a spinning disk. You can still buy a spinning disk for your backups and then you'll have your virtual machine, you'll be able to back it up. Your main limitation at that point is going to be bandwidth on how often you want to do your offsite backups. So thank you all for watching. If everything in this video was useful for you or if anything in this video is useful for you, please hit the thumbs up. Again, everything's timestamped, so help out people that are just like you. Thanks for stopping by. Signing out.